Hello and welcome to Sparda Lines, your one-stop destination for the civil services preparation, UPSC, KPSC and other relevant examination. We will try and understand some of the important articles that are picked up from your Hindu, which are important from both pre as well as your mains examination perspective. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article is speaking about CBI. What does this article say? It speaks about the consent, general and the specific consent. It also speaks about whether when an investigation has to be conducted by the CBI, do they have to take the approval and the permission of the central government to conduct such an inquiry or investigation. Why are we looking into it? That is because the Supreme Court of India has delivered a landmark judgment with respect to the approval of the central government. What is this approval? What is this general and the specific consent? We will try and understand everything about this issue. We have the one of the laws called as the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act. One of the sections in that happens to be section 6A. This was introduced back in the year 2003. What does section 6A speak about? It says Delhi police establishment shall not conduct any inquiry or investigation into any offence alleged to have been committed under the Prevention of the Corruption Act of 1988 except with the previous approval of the central government where such allegation relates to the employees of the central government of the level of joint secretary and above. What do we understand by this? Let's say for example, there is a person. This person might have committed an illegal act. He would have asked for bribery. So he is caught under the prevention of the corruption act. Why? Because he has sought for bribery from the people, which is against the prevention of the corruption act. And as a result, he would be charged under the prevention of corruption act. And if it is so proved that this person had sought for bribery, he will be thrown behind bars or whatever the law says. That is where we have the prevention of the Corruption Act. The Prevention of the Corruption Act ideally should not look at who the people are, what their designation is, whether they or not is enough. But then there was an exemption that was given in the DSP Act which said that if it is a person who is in the rank of Joint Secretary and above and this person happens to be working for the central government. If the Central Bureau of Investigation is investing this particular allegation in such a case, they have to seek the permission of the central government. What do we understand by this? Whenever there is a corruption charge which involves a joint secretary or a person who is above him in the designation, if this person has to be investigated whether he is corrupt or not, not, whether he sought the bribery or they have to seek the approval of the central government is the law that was present with respect to the DSPE Act of so and so. So what exactly happens? This ultimately means that there is a violation of equality principle. Why is there a violation of equality principle? What should be coming into picture is whether the person has committed an illegal act or not. Designation should not be taken into the picture. So if a person's designation is taken into the picture and the permission of the central government has to be sought, it ultimately leads to violation of article 14. Why? Because you are compartmentalizing people people, you are segregating people, you are separating people on the basis of the designation. Why designation when they have committed an illegal act. So the Supreme Court in 2014 had come up with a landmark judgment which said that corruption is the major menace to the entire country. Corruption is what is going to suffocate the country. Corruption is what is going to be a major harm to the country and as a result irrespective of who this person is whether he is a joint secretary or a person above him this approval of the central government which is mandated under section 6a of the DSP Act is a violation of Article 14. So the Supreme Court had clearly said in 2014 that this section that was introduced in 2003 is a violation of Article 14 because there is a segregation, there is a compartmentalization, there is clear introduced by the central government and as a result this particular section that is introduced in the DSP Act is a unconstitutional section said the Supreme Court of India. Why is it unconstitutional? Because it says that for a person who is in the joint secretary and above they have to sort out for a permission. Why seek for the permission in the present case? Because 
of the law that was introduced as part of this legislation. So, the Supreme Court called this particular section as unconstitutional and said that irrespective of who the person is, whosoever the person is, if he is committed an illegal act, if he is caught under the Prevention of the Corruption Act, he should be thrown behind bars and the central government permission is not required, said the Supreme Court of India in 2014. In 2014, this is what the Supreme Court said. In addition, the Supreme Court has now clarified that this particular section was introduced back in the year 2003. So, this means that it is not just from 2014 that this particular judgment comes into picture, that even for the cases prior to 2014. So, let's say there is an individual who is a joint secretary or above. He has committed an illegal act prior to 2014, which means prior to the sanctioning of the Supreme Court judgments. Even if before such a person has engaged in an illegal act, this can be investigated retrospectively, said the Supreme Court of India. So, it is not just about 2014 judgment, it is even prior to that. So, 2003 is when the section was introduced. So, in retrospective effect, we can have this particular argument of saying that if a person is involved in corruption, even prior to 2014, if even though the Supreme Court judgment was not passed, we can go ahead and prosecute this person, says the Supreme Court of India. So, basically, this entire segregation and compartmentalization of seeking the approval of the central government is not right and this is a violation of Article 14. So, prevention of the Corruption Act is getting violated, says the Supreme Court and such an application can be made in a retrospective effect, which means the judgment of the Supreme Court was in 2014. So, even prior to that even prior to that if a person is involved in corruption scandal that can be investigated by the authorities is what is this specific issue and when we speak about CBI we know for the fact that CBI has powers under section 2 of the DSP Act and it also has couple of wings within the CBI where does the CBI get its power where does the CBI get its power emanating from Notwithstanding anything in the Police Act of 1861, the central government may constitute a special police force to be called as the Delhi Special Police Establishment for the investigation in any union territory of offenses notified under Section 3. Subject to any orders which central government may make in this behalf, members of the said police establishment shall have throughout any union territory in relation to investigation of such offenses and arrest of persons concerned in such offenses all the powers, duties, privileges and liabilities which police officers of that union territory have in con connection with the investigation. So, we have the Central Bureau of Investigation which draws its power, it draws its power and gets its power from this legislation that is Section 2 of the DSP Act. This is one part. When we speak about the Central Bureau of Investigation, it basically engages in investigation. What are the kinds of investigation that the Central Bureau of Investigation enters into? It has the anti-corruption division that probes cases of corruption against the public servants. Why are we discussing about it? That is because the Prevention of the Corruption Act speaks about preventing the corruption. So, the anti-corruption division, so they have a division called as anti-corruption division. It can probe correction against the public servants whosoever is the public servant in the central government and in the union territory, they can probe about it, they can look into it, they can understand the root cause analysis of that particular corruption issue. Then they also have economic offences division which probes financial malfeasance, bank frauds, money laundering, black money operations and the like. And whenever there is money laundering, enforcement directed if it steps into the picture, the CBI immediately takes off from that particular case. So, if it is money laundering, generally enforcement directed also steps into the picture. And there is also a special crimes division to investigate cases of violence such as murder, crimes related to internal security such as espionage, narcotics and banned substances. When it comes to narcotics, one second, Again, what we have is the NCB which will also step into picture. So, you might have seen that whenever there is a murder that happens at the state level, you would have the state politicians, opposition political parties and many people asking that let us give this case to the CBI. So, it is the special crimes division of the CBI which will investigate murder related cases. For example, when Sushant Singh Rajput had also passed away, many people asked for passing of this particular case from the state domain 
to the central domain where the CBI would investigate it. So these are the divisions that we have when it comes to the Central Bureau of Investigation. And when it comes to Central Bureau of Investigation, there are two types of consent. One is what is called as the general consent. The other is what is called as a specific consent. What is this general consent? What is the specific consent? When it comes to the general consent, let's say for example, in section 7, it speaks about consent of state government to exercise powers and jurisdiction. Nothing contained in section 5 shall be deemed to be enable any member of Delhi's police special establishment to exercise powers in any jurisdiction in a state not being a union territory. What do we understand by this? We have the public order. The public order is in the state list. We have three lists. One is a union list. Second happens to be the third state list. Third happens to be the concurrent list. Where is the public order? It is in the state list. So whenever there is an issue with respect to the law and order and public order within the state government, who will investigate it? It is the state police. With respect to the union territory, there is no issue whatsoever because this law clearly mandates that the CBI would be able to investigate end of it. But when it comes to state governments, you have the state authorities. So when it comes to state authorities, they will investigate about law and order issues, murder related issues, so on and so forth. What if the CBI has to investigate a case in a state? That is when a general consent will be given by the state government. So the state government tells CBI that dear CBI, you would be able to investigate any of the cases that falls under your domain. So we are going to grant you the general consent. So the general consent basically means that the CBI would be able to investigate any kinds of cases that falls under its domain in a specific case in in a state on a uniform basis. So they did not have to ask the state governments permission every now and then. State governments give them the permission and ultimately they would be able to investigate in that case. But there is something called as a specific consent. What is this specific consent? When it comes to the specific consent, the state governments gives permission to the CBI only for a specific case. Let's say for example, there is Sushant Singh Rajput who had passed away or let's say for, for example, there is another person who has passed away. So only for this case that CBI is being given permission by the state government. So when it comes to the general consent for all cases they would be able to enter the state and investigate they need not have to ask the permission every now and then but when it comes to specific consent it is only for that particular incident only for that particular circumstance only for that scenario that they would be able to investigate and not for any other case or any other matter. So in general consent when the state offers it they would be able to investigate for all kinds of cases that falls under the domain of the CBI. But when it comes to the specific case, it is only a case which the state has given permission to. Other cases they will not be able to investigate. So that is the difference between general consent and the specific consent added to it let's say for example there is a case that is already being investigated by the state government when general consent was given by the state so there is a case uh, let's say hypothetically there is a case that is being investigated by the uh, CBI with respect to the state now all of a sudden the state government withdraws this general consent so does that mean that the CBI would not be able to investigate the existing case no the Supreme Court has already classified in number of judgments that if the CBI CBI has already taken over a case. It is investigating that case. It is understanding what is the root cause analysis of that particular case. In that case, despite the state withdrawing the general consent, the CBI would be able to continue its investigation when it was already sanctioned in the first place. So, in the future, when the general consent is withdrawn, only then investigation may not happen. But if it is already given to the Central Bureau of Investigation, in those cases, it will continue to investigate despite pulling off the general consent. These are some of the important parameters with respect to the DSP Act. One, we understood about section 6 of A which speaks about corruption. We understood that articles 14 gets violated and at the same time we also understood how CBI gets its power, what are the various divisions and what is the general and the specific consent. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into the next article. This article says launched of West Asia Economic Corridor is a historic says Prime Minister Narendra Modi. What are we speaking about? We are speaking about one of the corridors called as the India 
मिडिल ईस्ट यूरोप इकोनॉमिक कॉरिडोर सो हु आर द कंट्रीज एंड द रीजन दट आर प्रेजेंट वॉट वी हैव इज इंडिया देन वॉट वी हैव इज मिडिल ईस्ट दैट इज कंट्रीज लाइक सऊदी अरेबिया एंड यू ए एंड वी ऑल्सो हैव यूरोप इज वेल सो दीज थ्री रीजन एंड द कंट्रीज कम टूगेदर टू सपोर्ट ईच अदर एंड आउट स्मार्ट ईच अदर इन टर्म्स ऑफ इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ सो वी हैव प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी हु वेंट ऑन टू से चार्टिंग अ जर्नी ऑफ शेयर एस्पिरेशन एंड ड्रीम्स द इंडिया मिडल ईस्ट Europe Economic Corridor promises to be a beacon of cooperation, innovation, shared progress. As history unfolds, may this corridor be a testament to human endeavor and unity across the continents. So, which are the countries that are involved as part of this corridor? What we have is UAE, Saudi Arabia, European Union, France, Italy, Germany, and the United States of America. What is this corridor all about? this happens to be a transport corridor transport corridor of what it includes use of the sea lanes it includes use of the rail connectivity and road connectivity so that they would be able to expand on the horizons of the economic development this program or this scheme or the corridor is part of what is called as the partnership for global infrastructure investment so what is this corridor all about it happens to be a network of transport corridors including railway lines and sea lanes and this is part of partnership for global infrastructure investment what is this partnership for global infrastructure investment we have the g7 countries the western countries they always felt that we have china which is trying to interfere in most of their aspirations we have china which also has its economic model for the country which is in the form of one belt one road initiative but this one belt one road initiative has its own problems as well so there are countries which have taken loans from china these countries have taken loans from china for the development development of the infrastructure where they have taken this loan for the development of the infrastructure these countries are not able to pay back the debt to china and as a result the national assets or the national infrastructural projects are now under the control of china what are we understanding by this debt trap diplomacy what is this debt trap diplomacy china basically has huge pockets it has huge money so what does it want to do it wants to influence other countries as well how does it influence other countries by making an investment in the market by providing them the tools and other necessary infrastructure and the money let's take the example of hamban tota port or let's take the example of couple of infrastructure projects which china has taken up as part of the one belt one road initiative so it infuses a lot of money and when a country is not able to pay back the money and the debt and the credit what does it do it takes over this infrastructural project and one such project happens to be the hamban tota project which is a project in sri lanka so sri lanka developed this hamban tota project which happened to be the rail project which happens to be the uh, port development project as well as airport development project they were ideally have to they had ideally had taken the loan they were supposed to pay back this loan they were not they could not have paid this loan and as a result they have taken the national assets of sri lanka under their control so these g7 countries felt that china what it is doing currently is not ethical but at the same time it also feels that if we can step into the picture and also provide infrastructural support to developing countries so that they would be able to develop their own infrastructure they will be assisted and at the same time they will fall in ideology of the western powers on one side they wanted to make sure that it is convincing the world that what china is doing is not right what it is making the countries fall is in the debt trap so as an alternative there has to be something where countries can look up to that alternative was created by g7 that is called as the partnership for global infrastructure investment this infrastructure plan was first announced in 2021 during the g7 summit in the united kingdom in 2022 during the g7 summit in germany the pgii was officially launched as a joint initiative to help and fund infrastructure projects so increase they have infrastructure 
that needs to be developed for example roads or any of the climate related projects or the railways or the underground pathway so on and so forth the g7 countries will be providing the infrastructural support to the developing countries so in line with this support of the partnership for global infrastructure investment what we have is this corridor that is india west india europe and west asia where you have countries like united arab emirates as well as saudi arabia so this corridor basically will have two parts one is what is called as the eastern corridor which links india to arabian gulf while the northern corridor connects the arabian gulf to europe so it has two corridors one is the eastern corridor where india will travel where indian indian tools or indian infrastructural support will travel along the sea lane and this will connect to the arabian gulf and at the same time from arabia it will connect to the europe this is the plan as part of the scheme why has united states of america envisaged this particular scheme that is because first it would increase pro prosperity among the countries involved through an increased flow of energy and digital communications so if countries are part of it the, what we will have is maximum exposure to the increased flow of energy for example we know for the fact that uae as well as saudi arabia have huge volumes of fuel so they would be able to export the fuel they would be able to export the gases as well so from these countries of uae and uae and saudi arabia they would be able to export energy to europe as well as to india what does europe and india have to offer they will offer digital technology they will offer it services to these countries so this is a corridor which will help in basically connecting countries that is transport corridors and a network of transport second the project would help deal with lack of infrastructure needed for growth in lower and middle income nations so all those countries which are not able to deal with infrastructure these countries will pitch in and they will provide the infrastructural support so the idea being that you have china which is providing these economic support in the form of one belt one road initiative to substitute china to replace china to prevent the hegemony of china and the dominance these countries are supporting this particular program and the third it could help turn the temperature down or turbulence and insecurity coming out of the middle east that is why they have taken up this particular initiative and they also wanted to bring india into board that is because they know for the fact that india is not a country like china which will take over the regional resources and also keep them indebted for the entire lifetime no india is a country which has its own aspirations it wants to be a country which believes in the principle of vasudeva kutumbakam we will also grow we will also help others also prosper as well it is not at submerging it is not at having a subversive attitude like china is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article is speaking about green crackers what are these green crackers this has been developed by council of scientific and industrial research components in fire crackers are replaced with others that are less dangerous and less harmful to the atmosphere what happens in delhi whenever there are fire crackers that are burnt continuously this could lead to a lot of pollution we know for the fact that supreme court in the past has called delhi as the gas chamber so how do we prevent the pollution one is to prevent the bursting of the crackers but then this is also associated with religion this is also associated with joy this is also associated with celebration so how do we bring an end to it so instead of bringing an end to the bursting of crackers crackers they have introduced green crackers which tends to reduce or bring an end to the pollution so what are these green crackers when you con consider the traditional or the normal crackers they release a lot of gases into the atmosphere which increases the pollution so replacing these traditional crackers with the green crackers basically mean that they are less pollutant they are less dangerous than the traditional crackers so replacing this with the green crackers is the norm introduced that will be present in the near future so the commonly used pollution causing chemicals like aluminium barium potassium nitrate and carbon have either been removed or sharply reduced in the green crackers when it comes to the traditional crackers what do we have we have couple of crackers which make use of charcoal potassium nitrate sulfur they also make use of strontium and lithium they also make use of barium they also make use of nitrates 
when a person when a company is making use of charcoal potassium or nitrate it uses it in crackers primarily because the black powder which is the primary fuel of the cracker and when such is used it releases an inhibited different compounds form can be carcinogenic this can be cancer causing agents as well if strontium is used lithium lithium releases harmful fumes this can be a problem when barium is used barium fumes can cause respiratory and other health related issues and nitrates these compounds can hamper the growth of small children remain airborne for days and also be poisonous in order to overcome all these issues what we have is the introduction of the green crackers whenever green crackers are introduced and whenever we burst the green crackers how do we go about it how do we understand whether it is a green cracker or not there are three criteria established for it one is what is called a swash second happens to be star rating third happens to be suffer what is swash it is a safe water releaser which suppresses the dust released by releasing water vapor in the air it does not comprise comprise potassium nitrate and sulfur and the particulate dust released will reduce approximately by 30% this is swash then what we have is star it is a safe thermite cracker which does not comprise potassium nitrate and sulfur emits reduced particulate matter disposal and reduced sound intensity that is to do with star and finally what we have is suffer which happens to be a safe minimal aluminium which has minimum usage of aluminium and used more magnesium instead it ensures reduction in sound in comparison to the traditional cracker this is how you find out whether it is a green cracker or not so what are the advantages one it will reduce the particulate matter pollution by about 30% the cost of the green crackers is equivalent to that of the traditional crackers so you should be going for the green crackers then whenever you speak about these green crackers it will also come with a qr code which will basically help in identifying whether it is a green cracker or it is a traditional cracker so the minute we are able to scan the qr code you will understand whether it is a green cracker or a traditional cracker and this will not impact the livelihood of the people why because the green crackers are the replacement for the traditional crackers if at all the cracker industry is completely closed lot number of people will lose on their livelihood fortunes so in order to give them their livelihood in order to give them the sustainability in their source of work instead of going by the traditional workers let us replace with what is called as the green crackers so when we replace the green crackers what we will have is the continuity of the life of the people where they would be able to make a living out of it so replacing these traditional crackers with the what is called as the green crackers will help them continue with their livelihood these are some of the important pointers with respect to the green crackers now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about one of the canal projects what is the project all about this happens to be the eastern rajasthan canal project what is this eastern rajasthan canal project and what is the importance of this particular project so when we speak about rajasthan we know for the fact that it is one of the largest states in india according to the state water resources department of rajasthan rajasthan the largest state of india with a geographical area of 342.52 lakh hectares which amount to about 10.4% of the entire country holds only about 1.16% of india surface water and 1.72% of ground water among the state's water bodies it is only the chambal river basin which has surplus water but this water cannot be tapped directly because the area around the kota barrage is designated as a crocodile sanctuary so in order to make sure that the surplus water that is present in the chambal region is caught up is hold on to is saved and conserved and transferred to couple of water deficit regions in Rajasthan is the intention of Eastern Rajasthan Canal project. So what is the objective? There is surplus water in and around Chambal region. Let's safeguard this, let's conserve this, let's save this and then transfer this water to the water deficit region on the eastern part of Rajasthan. So when you consider the map, so the water will be saved and ultimately transferred to different regions of Rajasthan primarily for the drinking water purposes as well as for the irrigation. 
through the help of diversion structure, intra-basin water transfers linking channels and construction of pumping main feeder channels. The ERCP aims to create a network of water channels which will cover 23.67% area of Rajasthan along with 41.13% population of the state. So this happens to be one of the advantages. So what are the advantages when this project takes off? According to the Rajasthan Water Resources, ERCP is estimated to create an additional command area of 2 lakh hectares and an area of 4.31 lakh hectare which will get irrigation facilities because of this project. So at the same time, as it provides irrigation facilities, it will help the farming community. This will also provide water related facilities that is the drinking water as well. And this will further improve the groundwater table, helping the agricultural productivity. And at the same time, this will also be a sustainable water resource, which will also help industries as well. The industries that are located in and around Rajasthan can also use this water thereby increasing the employment opportunities more industries can flood up in the rural parts as well these are the benefits of this particular program now we have the chief minister of Rajasthan Ashok Gehlonji who has asked the central government to call this the national project what happens when a project an irrigation project becomes a national project one such example is we have the Polavaram project in Andhra Pradesh so when a project is given as a national project what are the advantages what could be the funding if these projects are taken up in any of the eight northeastern states two Himalayan states, Union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, the funding pattern would be to the scale of 90 is to 10, which means to say that 90% of the funding will be taken care by the central government, 10% would be taken by the state government. If the project is in other state, it will be 60 is to 40. So 40% will be contributed by the state governments, 60% would be contributed by the central government if it is attached as a national project. So only if it is attached as a national project, you will have the the central government making the funding so a specific amount of funding will be given by the central government what is the criterion to define it as a national project it has to be an international project where usage of water in india is required by a treaty or where planning or early completion of the project is necessary in the interest of the country or it is an interstate project which are dragging on due to non-resolution of interstate issues relating to sharing of costs, rehabilitation, aspects of power introduction, including river interlinking projects, or it is an intrastate project with add additional irrigation potential for more than 2 lakh hectare and with no dispute regarding sharing of water where hydrology is established or extension, renovation, modernization projects envisaging extension restoration of irrigation potential of 2 lakh hectare if it falls in any of these established criteria that project can be called as the national project and the central government will start funding that particular project so whenever we have such a project it is monitored by the central water commission and you will also have the central government support to such projects so you have a request that is being made by the chief minister of rajasthan to call this project as a national project is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about the award what are the what is the award it is the shanti swarup batnagar award the award is named after the founder director of council of scientific and industrial research the late shanti swarup batnagar and is known as shanti swarup batnagar prize for science and technology the prize is given every year for outstanding contributions to the domain of science and technology they would be given a prize value of about 5 lakh and this is for the sectors of biological sciences, chemical sciences, earth, atmosphere, ocean and planetary sciences, engineering sciences, mathematical sciences, medical sciences and physical sciences. So who will be awarded it? Any citizen of India engaged in research in any field of science and technology up to the age of 45 years. So if a person is above 45 years of age, they would not be given this award. And at the same time, overseas citizen of India and persons of Indian origin working in India are also eligible for this award. So it means that even if a person is not a citizen of India, but is an overseas citizen, overseas citizen of India, such persons can also be given if they are working for the country. 
the prize is bestowed on a person who in the opinion of CSIR has made consciously important and outstanding contributions to the human knowledge and progress. The prize is awarded on the basis of contributions made through work done primarily in India during the past five preceding years. The names of the recipients are made public on 26 September every year, the CSIR Foundation Day by Director General CSIR. These are some of the important facts from the preliminary examination point of view. Now let's look into the next article. This article here is speaking about Grisham's law. This Grisham's law is important from the preliminary examination point of view. What does it say? It refers to bad money drives out good money. What is it all about? If there is exchange rate, let's say for example, you have the market forces. It is the market forces which has to decide what one dollar is equivalent to one rupee or not. Let's say for example, hypothetically, today one dollar is about 50 rupees. Today one dollar is about 60 rupees. Who will decide whether one dollar is 50 rupees, 60 rupees, 70 rupees or 80 rupees? It is the market forces. So the demand and supply for that currency in a country will have to decide what is the rate of that particular currency. For example, one dollar is equal to how many rupees? 80 rupees, 90 rupees will depend on the market forces. But if a country is coming up and it is saying and fixing a value to the currency that is what that is when Grisham law comes into picture. So Grisham law comes into play when exchange rate between two monies or currencies is fixed by the government at a certain ratio that is different from the market exchange rate. So instead of marking creating that force or creating a value for that particular currency, if the government steps into picture and it attaches or tax that one dollar is so and so rupee or one dollar is so and so, that is when Grisham law comes into picture. The Grisham's law is named after English financier Thomas Grisham who advised the English monarchy on financial matters. It is not just for the currency, it is also for the commodity as well. This can be another important parameter from the preliminary examination point of view. So Grisham's law basically is to do with government fixing the currency exchange rate and not allowing the market forces to operate independently. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. In case you are liking our videos, please do like, subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it with your fellow aspirants as well. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.